so a very good mor uh, good morning to all of you and uh, welcome to the third day of this uh, non hermitian meeting uh, today uh, we have uh, the first speaker uh, jogesh naran joglega from indina and uh, he will be talking on quantum exceptional points uh, challenges and opportunities uh, jogesh you can go ahead okay so uh, can you hear me yeah okay and is my i guess my uh, mouse is also visible yeah. for everybody yeah. hopefully all right okay so then let me get started uh, so uh, good morning to those of you who are in i guess uh, india or japan and elsewhere and and uh, good evening or good afternoon wherever you are uh, my it's my pleasure to sort of uh, uh, be presenting at this meeting and i want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present here uh, so manas and, and bhabani in particular who have been long term colleagues as well uh, today i want to tell you about some work we have been doing at uh, iupui uh, which is in indianapolis where i am and uh, this is a work on uh, quantum exceptional points or exceptional points in the quantum domain uh, based on some of the the things that we have been working on uh, so i have a, a, a theoretical uh, physics group uh, with uh, three to four doctoral students uh, we have one or two undergraduate students and uh, we usually also have uh, some high school students who come in and and work with us basically and uh, uh, one of the features that we are sort of really interested in is uh, developing collaborations with uh, theorists but also experimentalists uh, this is a topic of sort of pt symmetry and non hermitian physics which we have worked on uh, for some time uh, with a intense focus on uh, trying to develop uh these models uh, in whatever your experimental platform for example is and i'll show you some examples of it so we work agnostically with experimentalists across different platforms uh, as well as with with theorists uh, to uh, try and figure out questions which uh, we think are interesting okay. uh so let me sort of uh, jump in and tell you the uh, the the broad picture of what i am going to talk about so i'm going to talk about exceptional points and we have had uh, excellent introductions to this uh, topic and the topic of parity time symmetry and uh, non hermitian systems uh, in general and so i'm not going to sort of go through that uh, basic uh, uh, information again uh, instead i will uh, start by uh, telling you uh, what i mean by certain uh, terms basically okay so in other words what is and what is not non hermeticity now uh, non hermeticity or more specifically dissipation uh, is a term which uh, actually has been used in different contexts uh, in different areas of expertise by people okay and uh, if you think about people who study uh, small quantum systems or open quantum systems and if you ask them what is a uh, uh, sort of dissipation Uh, then they will uh, typically come to it from the point of view of a uh, open couple sort of a quantum system coupled to a bath which is described by uh, some sort of a master equation or something called lindblad equation uh, i do not mean that so i am talking about non hermeticity uh, to represent systems uh, which undergo a coherent but non unitary evolution an evolution which is generated by a hamiltonian so it's not a lindblad trace preserving evolution and in general exceptional points uh, the thing that i will be focusing on uh, are degeneracies of these non hermitian matrices and just to be clear i'm going to just talk about finite dimensional models so that the subtleties which are sort of associated with you know infinite dimensional operators or their domains their inverses and so on and so forth will not matter we will be studying just simple uh, Uh, finite dimensional models which are uh, very closely motivated by experiments basically yeah. uh and so uh what i have shown here is a prototypical picture of the band structure uh that looks like uh, or the parameter sort of you know have the the energy levels as a function of some parameters uh for a uh, system which is hermitian that's the panel a uh, and a system that is non hermitian that is panel b okay uh if you uh want to be accurate this is these are all features that are coming about from a paper by uh, vijay chen uh and lanyang's group uh from 2017 okay. and 
uh, what is being shown here is uh, in panel A, it is showing the so-called uh, Hermitian degeneracy of the band structure or the diabolic point, uh, which is this point here where the energy levels cross. And the typical feature of this diabolic uh, degeneracy is that at this point, two modes of the system are degenerate. And when you introduce a perturbation which splits these two modes and therefore creates a level splitting, then typically the level splitting delta omega goes proportional to the perturbation epsilon. Okay. So at least it is linear. It might be higher powers if there are some symmetry arguments which sort of, you know, prov which uh, do not allow linear splitting. Okay. So the response of the system delta omega at this diabolic degeneracy point is proportional to the perturbation epsilon that you put in, in the system. Uh, in contrast to this, the energy level structure in the, uh, in, the, in the region of an exceptional point looks like panel B that is shown here. Yeah. And the idea here is really that I have a uh, non-Hermitian uh, degeneracy for the system. And in this case, uh, the uh, degeneracy basically leads to uh, a response of the system. Now, if I introduce a perturbation epsilon, which is basically uh, uh, introducing uh, degeneracy for this uh, point, then effectively that response delta omega at the exceptional point goes as square root of the epsilon. Uh, so if I have a perturbation of 1%, uh, then the response is 10%. And as you can imagine, uh, this becomes larger and larger, the relative ratio becomes larger as the perturbation becomes smaller, okay? And so this is sort of the key feature of a exceptional point degeneracy, a degeneracy of a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, which is marked by the fact that not only do the eigenvalues become uh, degenerate at that point, but the corresponding right eigenvectors, let's say, also coalesce together, okay? Uh, are the same thing for corresponding left eigenvectors, but basically the eigenvectors also become degenerate. And so at that point, the Hamiltonian is defective. Okay. So uh, this is uh, now, this is a feature which is not restricted to parity time symmetric Hamiltonians. It's generally there for non-Hermitian matrices. And I will just talk about that. But in particular, parity time symmetric materials is one example where these degeneracies are observed. All right, so exceptional points have been known in the literature for you know, centuries, uh, and uh, they have been experimentally explored over the last 10 years extensively in the classical domain. So in the classical domain, uh, you could imagine a, a, a simple dimer where you have two waveguides. One of them is lossy, the other one has no loss or maybe has gain. And, uh, there is some coupling between the two, which introduces the rabbi oscillations between uh, these two waveguides. And then when you start to tune the loss, when the loss becomes comparable to this coupling, that's when this exceptional point shows up in the parity time symmetric materials. Okay? In the lossy materials, again, it shows up when the, 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 the non-hermeticity is uh, comparable to the Hermitian energy scale in the problem. Okay. Now, these classical exceptional points uh, and their effects or their noise effects are something that have been well understood over the last five to seven years. Uh, this is uh, uh, shown over here are sort of three papers from recent times where exceptional point properties were used to uh, get enhanced uh, effect. This effect that I talked about where, you know, the uh, response of the system is much larger than the perturbation basically. Okay. And then along with this, uh, there are sort of issues associated with the fact that at the exceptional point, the eigenvectors become uh, parallel to each other, they coalesce, which means in its neighborhood, you have non-orthogonal eigenvectors and that leads to noise and that puts some uh, bottom line in there, okay? All right, so now this is all talking about classical exceptional points. My talk is related to what are quantum exceptional points. And so I want to, for the remaining, that of my talk, I want to mainly focus on this. What are quantum exceptional points, okay? So I'm going to consider systems which are described by an equation of this form. I times the time derivative of this some quantity A is equal to B times A. And then I have a question mark here and I will walk through sort of why I have these boxes and question marks. Uh, the way I have phrased this, this is very general because we'll find that it's something that 
sort of, you know, applies to variety of things. Okay. In the simplest model that you would be very familiar with, this is Schrodinger equation. So if I have A to be my wave function and B to be the Hamiltonian operator, uh, then uh, the equation that is written over here is nothing but time dependent Schrodinger equation. Okay, right. And uh, that describes the behavior, the unitary evolution of an isolated quantum system. Okay. Now you could ask, uh, this also applies to classical systems basically, where A might stand for some effective state vector, uh, which talks about the electric field in the paraxial approximation. If you have sort of considering the electric field dynamics in waveguides or in resonators and things like that. And in that case, the B corresponds to a matrix, which basically tells you how uh, electric field modes in one waveguide coupled to the ones in the other waveguide, or what's the rate of decay or amplification uh, of the electric field in one waveguide. So the matrix B will represent all of that stuff. Okay. Right. Uh, so the question is, uh, how do I make this equation quantum? Or what do I mean by a quantum exceptional point? What are the sort of you know, properties that I would need? And I'll, as I will try to explain in the, in the, uh, in the lecture, uh, there are varieties of ways in which this equation can represent a quantum exception point. So the first way is where A can be a classical or quantum input or output. So in other words, you know, the states that you are considering could be classical or they could be quantum. Okay. The second part is B, the matrix B. Uh, this could be classical or quantum Hamiltonian. And I will explain what I mean by that. Quantum Hamiltonian, everybody knows. Classical Hamiltonian is basically an effective time evolution operator or a generator of time evolution, which may be not talking about a quantum system, but could just be talking about, for example, dynamics of energy in an electrical circuit, which can also be cast in the form of a Schrodinger equation. And then uh, the exceptional points, if, if we are considering models of this type, then the EP is exceptional points, which are degeneracies of this non-Hermitian generator B. Uh, uh, those are in the coherent non-unitary evolution. So this equation represents all kinds of PT models that you have looked at. They also represent all kinds of passive PT models, uh, models where you only have losses instead of gain and loss. Uh, they also represent sort of classical models where you know A corresponds to electrical energy in an electrical circuit or a mechanical pendulum or you know electromagnetic waves, acoustics, whatever representation you want, it doesn't matter. Okay. But these equations also represent another class of time evolution equations. And those are the equations where A, this box A, this object A, is the quantum density matrix, basically. Okay. And this equation is nothing but a Lindblad equation, where the B will then stand for the Lindblad super operator with multiplied by an I, just to make it all consistent. And so in this case, this equation, this linear equation, equation which is linear in A, uh, will stand for essentially evolution of A, quantum system, open quantum system. And in this case, uh, the exceptional points manifest themselves in how the system basically goes towards a steady state. So in other words, in that case, you can, the system can approach a steady state in an underdamped way or a critically damped way or an overdamped way. And this critical damped behavior is what stands for exceptional points. Okay. Lastly, uh, I have a question mark at the end of this, uh, and this question mark is just to represent that is this really a correct description or is this a correct description of a fundamental system? Okay. So I will talk about each of these pieces in the remaining talk. I will first talk about models where A is quantum, but B is classical. Then I'll talk about models where B is quantum, so to speak. Uh, then I will talk about sort of, you know, uh, models where A and B are both quantum. And then eventually I will talk about if I get to this uh, question mark part, in other words, you know, what are the limitations in this description that I'm using? So the fundamental question is, uh, can we make quantum EPs? Or how can we realize exceptional points in truly quantum domain? And as I will tell you, uh, the answer is yes, uh, for across multiple platforms. So the platforms that we have worked on in the quantum exceptional points have been uh, in electrical, sorry, in, in photonics, uh, in ultra cold atoms and in superconducting circuits. I'll give you examples of each of those. And of course, all of these work is possible because of collaborations with some really talented experimentalists and theorists 
uh, who have taught me a lot over the years. All right, so the first uh, model of exceptional points sort of that I want to tell you about is uh, when you do a quantum input A to a classical device B, okay? And uh, the example that I will keep in mind as a prototypical example is a passive PT dimer. So what is shown in a carton here are two waveguides. The white one is the neutral waveguide. The red one is the lossy waveguide. I am considering only neutral lossy waveguides because those are the ones which you can get down to quantum uh, level without quantum noise effects, basically. And so uh, this is a passive PT dimer, which has been studied for a long time, uh, almost more than a decade, starting with first experiments by Christodulides that, that Paul Bender spoke about uh, in, in his introductory talk, for example. Uh, if uh, you have a device like this, which is two waveguides, one no loss, the other one loss. And if you put in bulk light in it, by that I mean just light from a laser, uh, then you would find that this system has an exceptional point of order too, basically, because it's just a two by two matrix, you know, the system that describes it. However, uh, and that is what we would call classical exceptional points. You know, you have a number of photons, which is very large and so on and so forth. Okay. However, uh, instead of that, if you started to do the following model, if you started to say, instead of putting in, in this uh, bulk light, I would use FOP input states. So in other words, individual photon states, okay? So I could put in a state with single photon or I could put in you know, two identical photons or three identical photons or four things that you get out of some SPDC sources, spontaneous parametric down conversion sources. Uh, then uh, you have a quantum input to a classical device basically, okay? And in this case, uh, you can use also number resolved output. So by that, I mean that at the end where you have these detectors shown by these tiny black dots, then you are not just measuring whether you are getting light out or not. You are measuring also how many photons you are getting out. So number resolved output. You can tell if I put in five photons here, you should be able to tell that I got three here and two here, for example, okay? Now, because this is a lossy device, you will also get sometimes you know one photon, sometimes two photons, sometimes three photons, all possibilities of them. And what we showed in this work with Roberto Leon, who is a, uh, an experimentalist and a theorist at, at uh, University of New Mexico, uh, sorry, University of uh, UNAM, basically in Mexico. Uh, what we showed was that if I have a system like this, uh, then if you put in an n photon state in this classical device and measure number resolved output and post select to an n photon manifold. So in other words, now you are only looking at data sets where you put in five photons and got out five photons, okay? All other data sets you throw out. Then this model uh, basically reduces to a, a model which basically gives you an exceptional point of order n plus one in this same device. So if I put in three photons in here, I can get an exceptional point of order four. If I put in two photons, I'll get an exceptional point of order three and so on, okay? So this is a theory proposal that we had a couple of years ago, but it sort of provides a way to look at uh, having quantum input into classical devices. Okay. You can take this idea further. You could, instead of having uh, this device, maybe you have a chip, basically a chip which can take in inputs, which are one photon, two photons, and so on and so forth. And then you are able to implement some sort of a unitary overhead. And this is a work which is done uh, in collaboration with Anthony Lang at Bristol, uh, where they are really good at making uh, quantum photonic devices, basically. Okay. So this is an example where you could simulate non-unitary time evolutions or non-unitary matrices. Uh, by using a procedure called unitary dilation, you basically make that a part of a bigger unitary. Okay. And so you could measure things like multi-photon statistics in a PT trimer. So what is shown here is a example of a three site parity time symmetric system. So I have a gain site, I have a neutral site and I have a loss site. So the gain site is in blue, the loss site is in red. Okay. Uh, and in this, I put in two photons basically. So the input here is one in the gain, one in the neutral. And you look at the probability of measuring all possible statistics, including you know, where you find it in the gain and neutral or you find it in other configurations as a function of time, as well as as a function of gamma, which is the dimensionless measure of uh, non-hermeticity or gain loss time. Okay? And in this case, uh, this is just a representative example of we having implemented this kind of a process. 
uh, yeah. And uh, it shows that you know uh, the data are the points are experimental data. The 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 surface is the theory plot. So this just basically says yeah you could do these things. And the message here is that you can access quantum EPs by putting a quantum input uh, to a classical device. That's really the main message that I want to sort of convey here. Okay. Sorry, can I make a question? Sure, please. Um. So uh, hi. Uh, so in the passive PT dimer, um, so does it matter in which waveguide do you send the end photon state or do you send it in both waveguides? So I didn't understand how, so I'm not experimentalist, so I wonder, I was wondering how you send this end photon to the system. Okay, uh, it doesn't matter for uh, the existence of uh, n plus one order EP, it doesn't matter. Uh, in the actual experiments, uh, Typically, people would put in a symmetrized. Uh, it, it depends on how many photon states you are putting in, basically. You know, okay. uh, but the mapping where you are putting in an n photon uh, state here, and uh, which is consistent with the Bose statistics, and you are post-selecting on an n photon state here, that fact that this kind of a problem maps onto an n plus one dimensional uh, PT symmetric model uh, is something that is generally independent of the input state. Okay, thanks. Okay, all right. Um, uh, hi, Yogesh. Uh, I have a, I have a question. So, uh, sure. In the ex uh, so in the experimental data, so how exactly do you sort of uh, uh, conclude that you have an nth order exceptional point? I mean, uh, do you uh, what exactly uh, after measuring what exactly uh, can you conclude that there is an nth order exceptional point? Okay. So there are uh, two ways to uh, conclude that there is an nth order, well, two or three ways to conclude there is an nth order exceptional point. Uh, one way is to look at the post-selection fraction because depending on the order of the exceptional point, how much, you know, here you are putting in, let's say five photons, you get out anything from between zero to five photons, you will get out because it's a lossy system. Right. And if you look at what is the post-selected fraction, which gives you five photons, Right. That fraction actually depends on the order of the exceptional point, basically. So when that fraction is enhanced? Uh, that fraction is not enhanced. Actually, it is at the exceptional point, it is smallest, but it depends in some way because you are critically damped, basically, you know. Yeah, okay. So the decay is the fastest. So, but essentially that statistics can tell you the order of the exceptional point. The second one is if you do more fancy experiments where you are now actually extracting out the dispersion, of the, of the system basically by putting in a single photon state, but uh, measure, doing tomography to get out the dispersion, then you will be able to uh, tell what's the order of the exceptional point by basically telling that you have, you know, uh, for a detuned waveguide. So now the two waveguides don't have the same index of refraction, have some little bit of detuning, then you will get a splitting which goes as delta to the power one over the order of the exceptional point. Right, okay, okay. thanks. thanks. Yeah. Okay, all right, so let me move along. So this is one way to think about quantum exceptional points. Take a classical device, put in a quantum state, and then try to look at what happens. And this opens up a number of questions. You know, you could ask what happens if I put in a non-classical state, you know, uh, even of bulk light, but sort of put in some non-classical initial states, uh, not single photon or Fox states, but other ones, then what kind of things do I get, which tell me that uh, the system has some exceptional points and what would be their properties? The second uh, option is where A is not classical, but in fact, the system itself is classical. So what I call quantum B, you know, in my, my uh, original equation that I was talking about, this sort of a modeling equation, now the B part is quantum. And by that, I mean, I have a, and this is a work done with Kater Murchis group in Washington University, uh, uh, who has a superconducting circuit transform, uh, basically as the platform. So in this case, the question is that, this kind of minimal devices are traditionally described by what is called a Lingard equation. So that's time derivative of rho equals I times the commutator with the Hermitian part of the Hamiltonian, which is what the system Hamiltonian is. And then the effect of Bath coupling in Markovian approximation is basically given by this kind of terms uh, where the gammas are some positive decay rates or dissipation rates uh, and L correspond to different dissipations. So this system is always described by this trace-preserving Lindblad description. 
And one of the key challenges, uh, which sort of, you know, community, uh, particularly the disciplinary uh, circuit community had was that, how do you make a system like this to behave in a non-Hermitian evolution, as opposed to the Lindblad, which is standard. And the key here is to be able to ignore this term, which is shown in this uh, sort of, you know, circle, which is the quantum jump term. If you ignore that, then this description is basically given by an effective non-Hermitian lossy Hamiltonian. Uh, and that can be mapped onto a passive PT model. Okay. So in other words, when you start with a minimal quantum device and ignore quantum jumps or a force select on quantum trajectories, which do not undergo the jumps, then you are able to actually take a minimal quantum system, a system where we are not talking about modes, but we are talking about levels actually, uh, and uh, take such a system and then able to get from there to behave in sort of in a non, for that system to undergo a, non-unitary but coherent evolution. Okay. So we did this uh, by uh, looking at a single dissipative qubit. And so uh, for those of you sort of familiar with this, essentially what you have is an artificial atom, uh, which is through a superconducting junction, uh, which is a artificial atom, which has, so this is a superconducting junction. It has some energy levels and uh, with appropriate uh, parameters, you can only have three levels, the ground, the excited, and the second excited states, the G, E, and F states. These are the only three states that you have in this trans bond. Uh, you set up such that you couple the two top two states of the trans bond by some rabbi drive, which is what we call J. And then you set up things, and this is the bath engineering aspect, which is crucial, uh, where you can set it up such that the decay rate from the excited state to the ground state is much higher then they decay it from the second excited to the first excited state, okay? Uh, now, this, in this three level, if I look at the dynamics of this entire system, it's boring because eventually all you will get is that the system ends up in the ground state. I mean, that's obvious sort of, you know, even if you excite it, eventually atom will decay and it will end up in the ground state. What is interesting is not to look at the whole data, but only to look at the data where the system does not jump to ground state. Now, this kind of resolution requires single shot measurements, which allow you to tell with good fidelity whether the system is in each of the energy levels. But once you can do that, then you get a whole data set as a function of time, and you only keep the data set where the system shows up in this manifold of top two levels. And if you do that, then the dynamics within this subspace is exactly that of a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, which supports an exceptional point. The, uh, the versatility of this platform is that you can actually do pretty much everything you want. And by that, I mean, you can initialize system in arbitrary states, you can track their tomography and so on and so forth. And so we did all this kind of stuff basically. And here is an example in the panel C that I show, uh, which is showing the inner product or the overlap of the two eigenstates of this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. Okay. Uh, this overlap of the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian is plotted as a function of J, which is this rabbi drive. It turns out for these systems, it's easy to tune J value while keeping the gamma constant because changing gamma, the loss rate uh, requires, you know, sort of essentially changing flux and then recalibrating it and so on and so forth. So you can change J in situ. And so in this case, this inner product, as you can imagine, when J is small, then this is a lossy system. It has just orthogonal eigenstates uh, because it's just anti-symmetric or anti-Hermitian system. When J is infinite, then the loss is zero and you just have a rabbi drive. So once again, the eigenstates are orthogonal. And what is shown here is the measured overlap of this eigenstates as a function of J, which goes from something small, deep in the PT broken region, rises up to one at the exceptional point, the quantum exceptional point, and then falls down again to zero once you are deep in the PT symmetric region. Yeah. So this is, Another way to realize quantum exceptional points where now you are doing post-selection in a minimal quantum device, basically. And once you have this, then you can do all kinds of studies with this, basically, which we are in the process of doing. Okay. And I'm happy to sort of answer detailed questions about this uh, at, at the, at, after the talk yeah, or you know, in general, there's no issue. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, if we have this, can I ask then- a uh, yes, sure, Federico. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, I mean, to which extent can you ignore quantum jumps? Uh, so, I mean, they eventually. 
Uh, yes, they right. do occur eventually. And what that just means is that uh, doing this kind of studies to long times is hard because the fraction of the quantum trajectories in which the quantum jumps have not occurred uh, decay exponentially uh, with time. But on the other hand, this is a platform where the time scales are of the order of microseconds, which means you can do a million experiments in about two hours. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, uh, and so the post-selection is not a problem because of the, the sort of, you know, experimental platform and the properties of it, yeah. But it's a good, important question, actually. Yeah. Now, the other example that you can sort of use, which we have uh, been recently studying, and here's an archive reference to this, is I mentioned that this equation also stands for, when I'm talking about quantum exceptional points, then we can think about this non-Hermitian evolution, but you can also think about models where A is the density matrix, and B is this Lindblad super operator, okay? All right. So in other words, now we are thinking about this equation, delta of rho equals L rho. And so density matrix reaches some steady state. The spectrum of L, as it is known, it has a steady state eigenvalue of zero. And then there are some complex conjugate eigenvalues which are decaying, so real part of them is zero. And in this case, the EP is really indicated by fastest approach to the equilibrium. So in this case, there is no post-selection. Uh, what is shown here in the figure is this sort of experimental setup for it. And what's shown in panel B is this uh, sort of trace of row or the occupation in the initial F level as a function of time showing that it goes from, you know, having underdamped oscillations to overdamped basically as time goes on, uh, as the parameters are varied rather, uh, basically. And so in this case, the exceptional point is identified by fastest approach to the equilibrium panel. Okay. Uh, now, this Lindblad then might seem like a better way to access quantum EPs, because in this case, you are able to get to quantum EPs without having to post-select. But on the other hand, here, you are measuring transient signals, because you're not measuring what happens at equilibrium, you're measuring how you reach equilibrium, so you're measuring decaying signals, so that gives you issues. The second sort of limitation, I think, of Lindblad EPs is that the eigenvalues uh, have density matrices which are unphysical. This is a beautiful work by Franco Nori's group, uh, which sort of started some of this along with Naomichi Hatano, who did one of the first examples I, that I know of, of Lindblad EPs. But the density matrix eigenstates that you find for a Lindblad operator are basically, there is only one physical density matrix, that's the steady state one, but the, the ones which are associated with these complex eigenvalues are trace zero. And so you cannot do things like, you know, more encircling or studies of eigenstates or measuring angle between eigenstates. These things that I showed you, which are possible in this non-Hermitian case are not possible when we are talking about the bad case. Okay. So this is all one sort of- uh, so can, I, can I ask a question? Sure, please. Yeah, so regarding uh, this unphysical density matrix state, uh, uh, usual lean blood equation, if I have this gamma to be uh, positive and time independent, then everything is physical, right? Because it preserves positivity. And But I, I think that the equation that you have here, this gamma is time dependent, which often captures this non-Markovian, non-Markovianity and various other things. And your positivity of these rates are not guaranteed. And that leads to sometimes unphysical uh, states. Is that is that what you are? Uh, uh, no. Sort of so the, yeah. So the, good point. So let me make that clear. Sort of uh, here we are still talking about completely positive trace preserving maps. So gamma is mm -hmm. positive. But if I look at this as a uh, vectorized, uh, you know, linear equation, uh, then the the pieces, of, so in other words, when I calculate rho of t, it will always be trace preserved and positive definite. That's, That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if I look at what are the eigen modes which constitute, sort of constitute this rho, then it will have one steady state piece, which would be there, and then there would be transient pieces. And these mm -hmm. transient pieces would have eigenvalues, you know, this eigenvalue exponential decaying evolution multiplied by some density matrices. And those mm -hmm. eigenmatrices are unphysical in the sense of they are trace zero because the entire trace is taken up by your steady state matrix, so to speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so, okay. so in other words, uh, if the, some of the questions that uh, PT models you can do where you can initialize the system in arbitrary states, you cannot initialize the system in arbitrary eigenstates of the Lindblad superoperator, even if the Lindblad superoperator is a completely positive trace preserving map. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, when you say exceptional point in this case, is it like uh, 
the fastest relaxing mode is coalescing with the steady state uh, mode is it what which is happening uh, so no it turns out that in this case the uh, the exceptional point only arises in the transient domain so in other words it's the there are two relaxing modes and basically you know or three relaxing modes uh, uh, whatever number of them are them coalescing together is what exceptional point indicates and that leads to the fastest decay okay thank you but those modes are always orthogonal uh, to the uh, set of you know you can be chosen to be orthogonal to the steady state mode uh, is it not uh, i mean are there any models where like uh, you can sort of tune some uh, parameters such that uh, the fastest relaxing mode like sort of uh, uh, gets closer to the uh, uh, steady state in the sense that it also becomes zero uh, again well, uh, i am not aware of it and on physical ground it sort of requires that it should not be the case actually in some sense right because you know you want the the eigen value of the fastest relax the, the steady state mode is always zero yes in, in principle so, like sometimes you can have multiple steady states uh, like maybe by tuning some parameter you can sort of lift that degeneracy yeah i i guess we can talk about that but i yeah, mean i know you. that yeah okay yeah, all right uh, uh, babani how much time do i have five minutes five minutes okay all right i think we are all right so this is sort of saying you know you can also do this lindlar in uh, if, uh, you can consider quantum uh, b if you wish and minimal devices and you can do either hamiltonian eps or lindlar eps okay. the third part which i want to talk briefly about and i'll sort of quickly go over it if there are questions i can talk more about it is uh, another version of quantum b if you wish uh, or quantum hamiltonian if you wish where now i'm thinking about interacting materials so in other words i'm thinking about models which are hermitian models it could be atoms ions rydbergs or real material quantum material which undergo some sort of quantum phase transitions uh, in this case you are not doing tomography because there are too many systems uh, uh, i mean too many degrees of freedom to do full quantum state tomography and you start with such hermitian models and introduce single particle losses and then you try to do a uh, sort of you know treat that as a system which is could be arguably called quantum exceptional points uh, one of the simple examples of this that we worked on with le luo's group who is now in sun yatsen in china but he used to be at iupui is where you start out with ultra cold atom gas so you have a dissipative system of ultra cold atoms so you have atoms in a trap coupled by some rabi coupling j and a spin selective loss so that only one of those hyperfine species which form this uh, two level system sort of gets kicked out of the trap uh, the time scales here are milliseconds as opposed to microseconds in the case of superconducting qubit and in this case this system again maps on to some uh, effective non hermitian model which has an exceptional point and uh one of the things that we sort of figured out was that in the case of static models you get a single exceptional point and it's usually difficult to sit at it so instead of having a static model if you made a time periodic model models where either the hermitian part or the non hermitian part vary uh with with time uh, periodically then you get a much richer phase diagram which means you get instead of exceptional points you get exceptional point contours okay so for example what is shown here in the right hand uh, bottom plate is a pt phase diagram where uh, these lines which sort of you know at the contours which are at the edge of this colored part and the blue part is what exceptional line contours are and the parameters here uh, the vertical axis is gamma the loss rate basically amplitude and the horizontal axis is uh, the frequency at which this loss rate modulates so we're thinking about models where maybe the the coupling modulates periodically with time or the loss rate modulates periodically with time and when you do that you get this kind of rich phase diagram with many resonances which basically tell you that you could introduce or have exceptional points which are arbitrarily close uh, to the 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 uh, x axis okay. uh, i don't have time to go over it so i'm just going to sort of quickly flow over and tell you that the floke engineering of ep contours turns out to be a really powerful tool to go from having isolated exceptional points to having sort of you know ep contours uh, uh, with a rich uh, phase diagram and this is valid in both classical and quantum domains so with robert olian's group we did something like that with electrical circuits uh, i have another student uh, an undergraduate student called zach cochran and we studied 
uh, these kind of floquet contours uh, in the case or floquet dynamics and exceptional points induced by that in the case of parity time symmetric systems with memory. So cases where the dissipation has some memory in it. Okay. Uh, you can also do this floquet engineering with quantum systems when you have Lindblad contours. Uh, so these are results for where L is now time periodic but it's still guaranteed to be CPTP, completely positive trace preserving math. And if you do that, then you get again contours, exceptional line contours, which is a rich variety of them. In each of these pictures, wherever there is a boundary between, you know, these sort of the color is the maximum, is uh, this bright yellow is where there is exceptional contours, basically. Because what's plotted here is inner product between the relevant eigenvectors. And this is some work done with uh, Jacob Muldoon, who is a, uh, one of my graduate students. He's attending uh, this meeting, not presenting. Yeah. All right. And there is also a poster on this from uh, Akhil Kumar uh, from uh, ISER. Yeah. All right. So this is on my last slide, uh, which is telling you about, I told you about what are the possibilities of exceptional points. And now the question is, is this a correct description? Uh, this is not really a correct description as, as Archak, uh, uh, who is one of the speakers later today and Manas sort of, you know, uh, taught me. Uh, and it's not a correct description because there are quantum noise terms which need to be taken into account. So you can do that and find that under certain approximations, uh, you can have exceptional points, but there are corrections to that uh, approximation that will take place if you, are, uh, if you are doing a more fundamental microscopic theory, okay? So I think that we have a way to realize quantum exceptional points. Uh, this leads to, and to realize them across multiple platforms, basically. I showed you some of the examples of quantum platforms where that is done. And so then that leads us to think about many questions which I have just written here. I will not go over them, but these are all open questions. So I think this is a really interesting frontier to think about quantum models which are physically relevant and think about what exceptional points will do to that uh, for us, basically. Where in the classical domain, what they do is now understood and fairly clear, but what happens to this in the quantum domain is, is uh, not understood. And so that's really an exciting area of research for us. So with that, I will stop and uh, take any questions. Okay, thank you, Jogesh. Uh, since we are running out of time, maybe one quick question and then we can have later discussion. Hello. Ha, because uh, go ahead with your question. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you, Professor, for the nice talk. Um, so, uh, question, so in the beginning of your talk, one of the slides. No, no, you are not audible, uh, because. Hello. Uh -huh. uh, so in, in one of the slides you mentioned, uh, we have we are talking about coherent and non-unity evolution, but not in blood, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, my question is. Can we develop a cross operator formalism corresponding to these PT symmetric Hamiltonians? Because both are like non unitary kind of uh, evolutions. So, the cross operator formalism by definition is trace preserving. And so, you cannot really map uh, this uh, coherent non unitary evolution into cross operator because one of the properties that it does is to uh, conserve the trace of rho. That's sort of the yeah. short answer. We can talk about it more. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah because I, that is the catch. I mean, I I was wondering because in one case it is not trace preserving, and in one case, okay, fine, fine. We'll talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, since we are running out of time, and uh, uh, let us thank Professor uh, Joglekar for his excellent talk, and. Uh, Thank you. Uh, and if you guys have questions, then just yeah. uh, email them to me or, you know, I'm, I'm here to chat about. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank no, you. Thank you. Yeah.